Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with the three months of Moto Logics, a sequel to the 100 Days of Logic and Logic 201. In this video, we're continuing our October focus on deontic logic, looking at the semantics of reductionist deontic logic. Semantics, we remember, are the official and kind of really rigorous meanings of all the concepts we have. Now that we have a different kind of deontic logic, reductionist deontic logic, this is KD, specifically is what we're focusing on, though it would effectively work for KS as well, we're going to be looking at what those semantics look like. So, the semantics for reductionist deontic logic are going to look somewhat similar to the semantics for standard deontic logic. Both can be visualized in terms of categorical logic, and we're going to replace AI with ARI, and add in all worlds in which D is satisfied. So instead of two kind of circles we're looking at, we're going to have three. That all normative demands are met. Remember, that's what it means for D to be satisfied, that all normative demands are met. So, it's going to look kind of like this. We have a triple Venn diagram. This circle includes all possible worlds that are accessible to I, which may be all possible worlds. This is D. This is all worlds where all normative demands are met. And this is P. This is all worlds where P is true. So, in this area, the non-overlap area of the D circle, we have Worlds that are not I-accessible, where P is false, but all obligations are satisfied. In the non-overlap area, the P-circle, we have worlds that are not I-accessible, P is true, and not all obligations are satisfied. In the non-overlap area of the ARI-circle, we have worlds that are I-accessible, P is false, and not all obligations are satisfied. In the overlap area between D and ARI, we have worlds that are I-accessible, P is false, and all obligations are satisfied. In the overlap area between D and P, we have Worlds that are not I-accessible, P is true, and all obligations are satisfied. And finally, in the overlap area between A, R, I, and P, we have worlds that are I-accessible, P is true, and not all obligations are satisfied. Oh, and of course, finally, in the very center, we have worlds that are I-accessible, P is true, and all obligations are satisfied. I just said a lot of words, and that might seem to have overcomplicated things. If you understand how a Venn diagram works, you should understand the basic concept here, though. That everything in the D circle is something where all obligations are satisfied. Everything in the ARI circle is something where that is I accessible. Everything in the P circle is a world where P is true. And if it is something that doesn't overlap, then it doesn't hold with that circle. Hopefully that's clear. And if you're not clear on that, check out the series on categorical logic for more. We can look at this as three sets of worlds. All the worlds where P is true, all the worlds where D is satisfied, and all the worlds that are accessible to I. And we're going to kind of use this format through the rest of the video to help us understand what we mean by certain phrases. So, it is obligatory that P. It's obligatory that P means that the only I accessible worlds where D is satisfied are worlds where P is true. So the only worlds that are both I accessible and all normative demands are met are worlds where P is true. You still can have worlds that are all normative demands are met but P is not true, but they can't be worlds that are I accessible. Or you could have worlds that are I accessible and P is not true but they would have to be ones in which it was not the case that all demands are met, right? Hopefully that makes sense, but we'll do an example to be clear. Let's say it's obligatory that no one steals. P is then going to be a world where no one steals. So in all worlds that are accessible to I, where all normative demands are met, no one in fact steals. That's the circle with the X in the center. It's the seriality rule that we talked about earlier. There always has to be at least one world that's accessible. All right, and we go on. It's permissible that P, it's going to look very similar, but this time instead of getting rid of that area, we're just going to say that there's at least one world where P is true, all normative demands are met, and that world is accessible to I. Hopefully that's clear. If you are unclear on these, check out the semantics of the original standard deontic logic. I go into it in a little bit more depth there. It's permissible that P means there's at least one I-accessible world where D is satisfied and where P is true. 
It's impermissible that P, on the other hand, means that there is no I accessible worlds where D is satisfied and where P is true. We put the little X in there because there has to be at least one I accessible world. All right? But it is impermissible that P means none of the worlds that are D and ARI that have all normative demands met and are accessible to I are going to be worlds that are P. No P is going to be true. And finally, it's omissible that P. It's omissible that P means there's at least one I accessible world where D is satisfied and P is false. Hopefully all of this makes some sense. Like I said, check out the previous video on the semantics of SDL if you're confused by this video. That gives you a little bit of a groundwork to kind of work up to this video in. And also look at the videos in the original 100 Days of Logic on categorical logic. Those might be able to help you out as well. All right, up next we're going to be talking about the reductionist deontic logic that includes axiom T or axiom M, whatever you want to call it. We're going to call the whole thing KTD. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org. Stay tuned for the big finale, the end of the deontic logic month coming up on the 31st of October and a brand new month of temporal logic, logic about time, starting on the 1st of November. Stay skeptical, everybody.